Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today we are carving wood. <laughs> hey! I'm sorry. Quiet in the peanut gallery. I'm gonna leave. <laughs> it's gonna okay, be a long day. Let's do a, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. Hi, I'm Rajiv. I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> today, I have a friend with me, and we are carving wooden cutting boards. I love to learn things that connect me to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And in my friend's circle, we're always recommending books to each other. Oh, I just read this book about Chopin, and that makes me want to sit at the piano and learn a nocturne. Recently, one of my very good friends, Laura Federley, recommended a book about Grinling Gibbons, who was a master woodcarver in England. Getting books like this and seeing what is possible with a chisel and some wood, it just, this is the kind of thing that makes me go, I want to do that. So my friend Laura is one of my closest, dearest, most special people in my life. And she lives in Toronto. Almost once a year, she comes down and stays with me here in New York. And when we're together, it's like wood carving, knitting, painting, watercolor painting. This is a picture of, of me and Laura at Pioneer Village years ago. Laura, why didn't you just... Here's Laura. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> hi, 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 hi. Do you want to just yeah. grab that chair? We have been talking about doing this for years, carving a cutting board side by side. We're finally doing it. We started all of this at Black Creek Pioneer Village, where we used to work as teenagers. We were spinning wool, we were blacksmithing, we were working in a print shop, and we worked in this cabinet shop. We had this wonderful mentor. His name was Bert. And he was he like in his 70s at the time? At least, yeah. He was retired and he would come in and just sort of stand there with us and tell us what to do. Bert was my first instructor in wood carving. Yeah. Laura, you had your, was, you I had had your papa. I had papa, but Bert was really, he showed me how to carve. Bert did. Bert was old school. He was a real wood carver. He was Dutch. He was like five feet tall. Yeah. And he knew how to do everything perfectly. So I just want to show you some things. Um, that we actually made at Pioneer Village that are kind of antiques for us now in our <laughs> lives. This is a this is a board that Laura made. Did you make this at Black Creek? Yeah. And how old is this? Like 20, I mean, it's 20 years old, 2002. And Laura had made a version of this from a pattern, attempting to do it, it was in a- It Bert's pattern. It was his pattern? Yeah. So you just attempted it. Yeah. And she thought she had done a pretty good job and then Bert came in and started laughing at her. It was ridiculous. And saying like, you did this all wrong. So this is the second version of the board with Bert's tutelage yep. over her shoulder. I made this at Pioneer Village from a tree that had been cut down. I turned it on a lathe that was foot powered. It's a hundred year old lathe that was foot powered. Bert showed me what to do. So this thing, this board has traveled around the world with me. During the pandemic, I thought I really wanna get back into this. I haven't touched a chisel for 15 years. And I thought I was gonna copy Laura's board. So Laura and I corresponded <laughs> like <Nerds>. over. <laughs> and I made my own version. We inspire each other to make things. And when you find friends, when you have friends that have a skill, it's so nice to just be side by side with them and then to share that skill with them. And then we, we thought, oh, why make the same board? Let's do something different. So we've both been on this French kick lately. Um, Laura has been obsessed with Marie Antoinette and Versailles. Is this the book you're reading right now? Yeah. Versailles. When we talked about creating a new cutting board, I said, why don't we do something that was like from Versailles? In Versailles, especially in the Petit, Petit Trianon. The P Petit Trianon, which was, is that her, Marie Antoinette's like little playhouse? It's not the play, it was it was her escape. So it's this little, it's little, right? It's it's a mansion, oh, it's huge. Okay, in my head. But compared, compared to, to Versailles, Versailles, it's small. <laughs> it's small, and the Petit Trianon is full of carvings on the walls. So I thought, why don't we just pull something directly from that building? And that's what we're doing today. We are going to make some cutting boards that look like they could have lived in the Petit Trianon. Who has to edit this? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like 30 minutes of talking. <laughs> of rambling. It's not
not talking. Like, like, where is he going to cut this? It's not my problem. <laughs> the great thing about what we're doing today is you don't need any power tools to do this. I made this cutting board in this bedroom. Um, and I do a lot in this bedroom. <laughs> I do a lot of creative things in this bedroom. I do a lot of, I use my, <laughs> the thing about this bedroom is it's my studio as well. It's my little art space and I don't have a lot of room, but you don't need a lot of room to do something like this. So I wanna tell all of you, you can make this cutting board without any power tools in your bedroom. Children. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we get nothing done. I know. Okay. What are we doing next? What are we doing next? Um, we're going to start. So, in order to make a wooden cutting board, you need a wooden board. And where do you get that? Well, they don't have boards like this at a normal hardware store, right? They have some of the this width. This is eight inches, I think. Yeah, I think that's the yeah. widest at a normal. Okay. They store. have hardwood like maple yeah. at like. Okay. Maple. Okay. It's not easy to find large pieces of hardwood. So what woods are soft? Pine is a soft wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cherry's hard, walnut's hard, maple's hard, but maple's hard but can also be soft. Mm -hmm. um, so there's hard maple I and think there's soft ash maple. is somewhere in between. Okay. Lime wood's also somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Like there's there are like hard soft woods. Hard soft okay, right. Yeah. What's the most ideal board for a cutting board? Maple. Ma so this is maple. Yeah. Um, do you know why? Because the grain is very tight. Yeah, that is why, okay. because it's the tightest grain. So Laura's going to use maple, which she was able to find near her in yeah. Toronto. I'm using a very nice piece of walnut, which I found in Rhode Island. It's from lumber that they cut down locally, and it was milled there. The only thing about this board is that the grain is open, and you can see that the grain is open. So as you start to work with wood, one of the very important things that you learn about and that you must take into consideration is the grain of the wood. Wood comes from a living thing. It's not like clay, which you dig out of the ground and you refine and then can sculpt into a figure or make into a pot where all the platelets are the same. Wood is a creature. And if you think that you are just going to take a chisel to this and carve out a pattern, then you're gonna encounter a lot of disappointment because you have to look at the grain in order to understand what, you, what you'll be able to carve on this, right? So the wood on this board is running this way and this way, right? Yep. So the tree was growing up like this, Yep. right? Like this was a branch right here. I was just gonna ask you, yep. so that knot right there, what would this... Well, it's so just gonna be harder to carve and it's gonna do things that you don't expect. So when you're on the straightest grain like here, yeah. you can be confident that when you put your chisel in, it's gonna it's gonna go this direction. Yeah. If you put this in here, it might chip right here. Because okay. right here, the, w the wood was going like this. So that's kind of the thing that is daunting about this, but also the thing that's beautiful about this is you have to actually look. You have to look at the piece, not just the wood, like maple and walnut, but the actual piece that you have. And you can manipulate your pattern around marks in the wood. And Laura has spent a lot of time creating patterns for these boards that were inspired by um, Versailles, Marie Antoinette, Le Petit Trianon. And where are they? Let's look at them. So, you have your board, and now you're gonna cut this design out. I made it this size, so that all of the carving that I'm gonna do is avoiding this little knot. So I'm just gonna tape this yeah. onto the board, okay? And then it's just a matter of tracing out the pattern onto the wood. What I'm drawing right now is gonna be the profile. It's gonna be cut out to this shape. So we have this pattern now transferred out onto the board. Now, what do we do? Now we have one tool that we're going to use to cut this out. It is called a coping, coping saw. saw. This is a coping saw. Um, 
Why is it called coping? I have no idea. You know, like when I put on the apron, it always makes me feel like I'm in the zone. Like I'm going to work. Yeah. Yeah, me too. That's like the power of an apron. Yeah. Did you? You didn't make that one, did you? I think I found it on the street. <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s. I made pain. Of course you did. So this has to be anchored to the table so it doesn't move. There. So that's really that's secure. Okay, so here's the thing. I, if I was cutting this out, mm -hmm. when I've used the coping saw, I can only cut towards me. Okay. I would mm -hmm. start out here, mm -hmm. and I would make this cut in here, but you can cut like this away. I sit down. Yeah. Is, yeah. Can I just see you? Yeah. Like I would start like this. Yeah. And you make the cut. I have never done it that way. Can I try? That's, That's how, how I was shown. By Bert. By Bert. Wow. I yeah. didn't know. You have a lot of control that way. And just your. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really good. <laughs> like my approach, this is what I would have done. I'm kind of embarrassed now. No, I want to see it. <laughs> and this doesn't need to be straight because it's going to be waste anyways, right? Now I know why you broke two blades. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot my glasses. Eye protection, very important. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so I go like this. So this is new to me that Laura, all these years, has been cutting um, away and like up like this. Yeah. I'm gonna learn how to do it this way because you'll like it. Yeah. You have so much more control than. Yeah. I didn't think that I did. Yeah. This feels like it wouldn't, but you're right. It's so much better. So. This would take quite a bit of time and patience, um, and we would do it in sections. But when you've done this, it'll look like this. So this is a board that Laura cut out and is now ready for the pattern, the actual carving pattern, to be transferred onto its surface. And how do we do that? We are gonna attach a piece of, here's the pattern. Yeah. So Carbon paper. Laura's pattern is different than mine slightly. She designed both of these beautiful designs. So carbon paper, it's not easy to find these days. No. Like you can't just, there was a time when carbon paper I think was a part of office supplies. Yeah. You can't really find it everywhere now. I got this from the art store. It is something that's a specialty item, but it's perfect for this technique. You cut a piece of carbon paper out, you put it on the back, you make sure that the carbon side is going to touch the wood, right? So it looks different, right? Yeah. The dull you can feel it too. It gets waxy. And then we tape this whole thing to the board. And then you just use a pencil? Just a pencil. It's a specific This kind. one's a hard one. You want it to just transfer really strongly. So you've scribed it on and now what does it look like underneath? <laughs> Transfer. Wow. Okay, so the very beginning of the carving is something called stabbing out. And stabbing out is a technique that helps you anchor the tools to these lines. Because it's a subtractive process, we're taking away material, we have to take away the surface. So very quickly, these lines are gonna go away. And in order to really start to learn how to carve, you have to develop the ability to see these forms in three dimension. You have to put them in your mind as an actual three dimensional form. You have to be able to see that this scroll is gonna curl underneath and twist in on itself. And it's gonna look like a wave. And if you can't see that in your head, then you take this line away and you're lost. So, this is something that you develop. You don't start with an ornate carving like this. You start with a little four-petaled flower, which mm -hmm. is where we started with Bert. Yep. Bert, our mentor, showed me how to carve yep. that. That was the first thing I did too. Same with me. He said, you stand over here. Do this little flower over here. Learn. He didn't sound like Arnold no. Schwarzenegger. So, so, where would you put your first cut? I would start where, as you were saying before, you're visualizing what this is going to look like in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. So a shell is almost like a bowl shape. So mm -hmm. this is going to scoop up like this. Mm -hmm. This part 
here is the focal point of the design and it's gonna be the deepest. This is where your eye, the whole design leads you right here. So I would start by stabbing out all along here yeah. and stabbing out all along here. Depending on your pattern, mm -hmm. will determine how wide you can have your chisel. So this is perfect for here. This one we might want a smaller for these little bits of flat here. chisel, but you can also just use the edge. You can just go in sideways ah, like okay. that and go all the way around. Okay. But let's get a smaller one, which Bert made. Oh, Bert made this for you? Yeah. Wow. She Th old. This man is no longer with us. He passed away when he was in his 90s and Laura and I talk about him with such reverence and we remember him. He gave us a gift that we will never lose. He gave us a, the knowledge and the skill to be able to do this and to have something, as I've said before, to have a tool in your hands that was made by someone that taught you something. Yeah. It is, it's priceless, yeah. it's precious. Yeah, That's it's my so favorite. That's so wonderful. Okay, so I'll just start here and you're just pressing it down. You're basically just following the line. Are you trying to go as deep as possible? Yeah, yep. That's all I would do to start. Okay, so Laura, you've stabbed out these lines. Yeah. Why do you stab things out? So, especially if you are a beginner, mm -hmm. um, if you just go in first with your biggest gouge and you just start whacking away, yeah. there's a chance that you're gonna go too far. Yeah. So what this does is just kind of, it stops your chisel. It's like a barrier. It's a barrier, So yeah. if you didn't stab out, then you could very easily slip and take off wood. Exactly. And you can never add the wood back on. You can, but it's not pretty. You can okay. always glue a piece in, but you don't want to do that. So here's the thing that I didn't I, did, I, I didn't know. The grain is running here. Yep. I would just assume that I could take this gouge and I could go this way or this way. Is yep. that correct? Sometimes you can, but it will it will tell you, the wood will tell you when you can't do that. It's like petting a dog the wrong way. So if you, oh. like you pet the dog, the fur goes this way, yep. it feels nice. You pet it the other way and it goes, it like, it goes up. Yep. The wood is exactly the same. So, so there is an optimal direction even this way? So this even way? this wood, even though the wood, the grain is going this way, yeah. it's also either going like this or like this. Okay. Sometimes. So, but you'll, you'll know because if you go in here, mm -hmm. it will, it will feel exactly like petting a dog the wrong way. If it goes in clean, yep. then you've, you're going with the grain. So you don't know at this point whether this way is the optimal I direction. I don't. But, but it could be this way. Yeah. So what would you do? How would you? Do you start. With the mallet? Yep. So. And they, just, this is very sharp, right? This is really sharp. Like yeah. you've honed that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's sharp. So I would just start here. And it just pulls up right uh, where where you stabbed. Where the stab so mark is. That's why you stabbed. Yep. Because if you didn't stab, it could pull off some of this. Exactly. Also, at this point, mm -hmm. it's messy, and it's going to be messy for a long time. Like it's not pretty for the first like few yeah. hours. So get that out of your head. <laughs> you just have to get it out of the way. You can also angle. The gouge, like when you go in, you can go in like this and angle the gouge up to take if you want to take out like less and control it more at the end. The key thing is that the grain doesn't matter as much if your chisels are really, really sharp. Okay. Like you want to go with the grain as much as possible because mm -hmm. it's easier that way. But mm -hmm. you can you can go against it and you have to go against it sometimes. Well, after about just 50,000 hours, <laughs> you'll have something that looks like this. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to carve hardwood. And this is something that we like to do leisurely. Take your time, put it away once you've had enough of it for the day, come back to it later. Uh, and gradually work until the shape is really emerging. And that's where we are right now. So I have my board, which is the walnut board, and we have Laura's board. And they're kind of, um, they're kind of at the stage where you can see the form. You can see the form emerge. And uh, what we're doing now is we're just continuing with the same techniques, but you end up using smaller and smaller tools 
as the design gets finer and finer, right? Exactly, yep. So can you tell us what you're working on right now or what you will be working on? So every little area now mm -hmm. is roughed out and just needs to be refined. Okay. Somebody <laughs> was a little too forceful with his mallet and his gouge <laughs> and went right through the top. Yeah, so we've had to alter my pattern. I'm gonna just incorporate my errors into the design. So the boards are at a place right now where we really can see our forms and now it's just much more of the same thing with smaller motions, more delicate, being more careful and often using smaller and smaller tools because the detail gets finer and finer. Let, let's talk about this. Let's do a few. Um, this is a, this sort of rounded thing, that's a gouge, it's, right? That's a fishtail gouge. If it has a bowl in it, it's yeah. a gouge. Fishtail gouge. This is a gouge. This is a straight gouge. Straight right? gouge. So, even this with a low angle is still a straight gouge. Even though it has just the most delicate angle, still a straight gouge. What's a chisel? Flat. Yep, this one. That's a chisel. Flat. Let's show them a parting tool. Parting tool? Parting tool. Or it's a V like tool. A, it's like a V. And we'll what about this one? Is this a skew chisel? Yep. What's wonderful about this is it's, it is kind of instinctual. When you have something and you're going for a shape, you're like, I know this has to be curved. And you have something in your hand and you start and you're like, nope, this is making like a, this is making a gouge out of this raised part. That's the wrong thing. The shape will dictate what tool you need to pick up to refine it. Now it's just getting to work. It's go time, baby. It's go time, baby. Here's another tip. When you're doing an activity like this, you should really just assist yourself with the beverage of choice, tea, coffee, champagne. Champagne. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, boys, wear your glasses. Come on. Get over here, boys. Get over here, boys. Well, Laura has been doing this for many more years than I have been doing it and she has a 98 year old grandfather who has been carving in her presence since she was a baby so those are all reasons why I didn't finish my cutting board but she finished hers and with a cutting board that you're going to use in the kitchen you want to treat it with something before you start using it you want to treat it with something that is food safe you can actually use flaxseed oil from the health food store, the flaxseed oil that you could actually consume. You can put a little bit of that on, like a light coating of it with a cloth and then lay the board in the sun and it'll dry. It needs to dry and cure. Don't put on a very thick layer, otherwise it'll get sticky. You want the wood to kind of absorb that oil. Well, this is like a mixture of some oils and beeswax um, that's also food safe. You're doing a great job. This, look at this. This is the sort of thing that just makes me feel like the days were worthwhile. That the time that we spent making something like this was, was quality time together with a person that you loved, with a person that inspires you, with a person that makes the hours fly by like minutes. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you didn't, but please subscribe for more videos just like this one. Can I keep this? No. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I knew you were going to ask. <laughs> no, I'm
you really this know? Home. Did you really know that I was yes. gonna ask? Yes. But you have that board. It's, this is mine. But you're gonna make that other you board. You have this one. It's have, not finished. Have fun with that. I need this as like a model for like using no. to know what no. to do. 